Okay. Hello, everybody. And if you can believe it, it's already time for February's Inbound Lunch Bunch. I'm Suzanne Carowin. I'm head of uh, Sales and Marketing here, Chief Marketing Officer at High Road Solution. And as I promised you last month, if you're an avid uh, Inbound Lunch Buncher, as many of you guys are, that actually this time would be Manisha Mangus, but we're going to have to wait till March because um, unfortunately with the weather delays, she's uh, been stuck in Newark. And so um, I'm going to have to present today uh, for this time together. So today we're going to look at a really, and again, a couple of things to recap. Um, that we're going into the deep dive series now in 2016, right? So we'll, we want to remember that in 2015, we kind of did this big high-level overview of what is inbound and things like that. So today we're doing a deep dive on converting web visitors to prospective customers. And as all inbound lunch bunches are, it's um, a lot of idea-based, you know, have you thought about, et cetera, et cetera. So that's today's topic that we're going to delve into. And then just to recap, if I can get my slides going here. A couple of things to remember that these are intended to be loose, informal types of, um, of sessions today. And one of the things we want to really uh, make sure is that they should stay that way because we certainly now have the opportunity. So at this point, uh, we're a year, almost into a year of doing these regularly. Um, and the topic has come back up of should we go back and do them in person and live stream them and have some people together in DC and those types of things. And those are all possibilities. So we're going to be sending out a survey after um, the session today to try to get a sense of like where he wants us to go, right? This Inbound Lunch Bunch series is really started by our uh, demand that we've heard of people saying, hey, I'd like to be able to do this. And also it, it's kind of more, it started as an interactive forum and it's morphed into kind of this lecture forum because that's what people said they want. I just want to do a touch base and make sure that's still you know, accurate and maybe we want to add on. Maybe we want a lecture and then we want a time to talk together. And so we want to kind of investigate some of those things as well. What we heard last, week, last year was that the content was so new that people weren't ready to talk about it. They just wanted to sit back, you know, spend their lunch hour graciously with us, get the content, digest it, and start to then um, do things. As an interest of a market interest, we've really seen the demand bump up in the fourth quarter. We just did some analysis we'll share with you as well. The fourth quarter of last year, all of a sudden you're seeing more and more organizations starting to look at, hey, what's inbound? What is it? Does it mean to us? Is it something we should get to? That's all really exciting. So just a couple of recaps of you know, setting expectations because we have a lot of new people who are kind of getting into the program now. Um, it is loose. We're brown bagging it. You know, it's interactive. If you have questions, you can use the chat feature and stuff, and, and Liz can, um, can respond to those, and we can get back to you afterwards. But this is intended to be super heavy education and lots of resources. So if you missed any of these, we have um, recorded all the past years, and they're all up there. And what we do for each one is we have some resources available, the slides are available, the recording is available. Again, this is a bit of a like a, a bootleg, bootstrap type of program. So some of the recordings, the audio, yeah, you might hear some people munching Doritos. I think last time we had somebody like heating up the burrito in the background. So whatever, you just have to kind of roll with it and understand it's all about the content. So we also have a bunch of toolkits here that are appropriate for um, especially this session, which is the Personas Toolkit. Each month we put out a toolkit that is intended for marketing and kind of I, I would say the business owners or the program directors um, in organizations to help you with kind of um, enterprise level vetted toolkits to help you plan and be more effective. They're meant to be kind of a calculators or things that you can be that are actionable. And in particular in today, the Persona Toolkit, we just want to highlight, you might want to go back and download that if you haven't. And there's some webinars on that as well and put it in the resource page. But it's particularly useful because it's kind of a, this is kind of like, it's assuming you've kind of gone through these activities and we're now on to kind of the planning out of the, I've gotten people to the website kind of now what. All right? And so lastly, also marketing automation is an ebook on that because we talk a lot about that. And so we have an ebook out that talks about debunking the myths and the different players in the marketing market and whatnot. So those are just some reminders and resources. And then my only plug that I have today is that we do a, um, a study each year. This is our third year of doing it. And it's called the State of Digital Marketing and Associations Report. Um, the survey period is now open. If you are gracious enough to participate, you'll net yourself a $5 gourmet 
coffee card, but maybe more importantly, the, um, the results that come out are really what many of the organizations we're working with are using to build their business case as to why they need to get into marketing automation or why they need to get beyond having just an email system, etc. And it has a lot of data in there that's showing you kind of the misalignment and why we're seeing things happen in the market today. Things about budget, things about not having a maybe a high enough level um, marketer on staff, things like that. And I've seen now into the th third year of this how that data is really now being incorporated into business case. And if you need to help make your own business case, by all means, that's what we're here to help you do at High Road. So call us up and, and we can talk about it. But there is the site and it's open now. And just a reminder, it was a long period of um, collecting the data this year, and the report itself is released at ASC Annual, so that which happens in August. The past reports you can download on our website for 2014 and 15. All right, and there's videos and more stuff about that. So it's a big study for us, and we utilize it heavily. All right, so let's get into it. So just a refresher of to reset and say, you know, give you some context. What are we doing today? I told you about the Persona Toolkit we want to use. But the reset of today is like, let's step back again and say, what again is inbound marketing and what are we doing? And the bottom line is that it's a whole series of processes, many of which are not new to associations, certainly not to association marketers. Um, these are not things that you probably um, aren't doing now, but what the difference is a lot of times is the organization is doing it more piecemeal or more from a tactical standpoint. Sure, you're posting to all of your social channels. Sure, you put out email. None of this is new to you. It's the incorporating it into an integrated strategy that's really now focused and from the premise of coming from I need to focus in on specific personas or specific target markets and understanding the buyer's journey and how to map that out. The methodology part is usually the new part. So again, here's the kind of steps of overall inbound um, marketing. We want to attract new people that we don't know, right? Because if we remember to recap, we say it over and over. If I'm only marketing to people based on my email list, right? That email list, 25% of it is kind of going bad each year. I've got to refresh it. I can't buy lists. That's kind of a big no-no, right? So I have to organically grow that somehow. So I got to get, I got to keep replenishing that email list because it's kind of has a, it's always leaky. And then I also need to go get new people I don't know at all, right? Because that's going to be my biggest. Uh, bang for my buck. So I need to attract new people. I need to basically capture them, convert, and start to push them down the funnel to convert them to the point where they're actually going to make the buying decision. They're actually going to purchase in whatever transaction we want to discuss. You know, call that whether that's actually uh, you know an actual transaction. They purchased something in the shopping cart, or they took a desirable action. However, we want to um, define that. But then, and then uh, additionally, how then would we kind of um, continue to nurture them. But all of this is happening in the, the context of this is that what we want to push today is all of this is usually the goal is to get them back to our website, right? So what we want to focus in on today is what happens when you got them? Like it worked. You got them to the website. You know, you either got them from maybe you had a digital banner ad out there or you had Google AdWords or they saw you at a show or they got a they got a direct mail piece. Like somehow they got to your website, right? What do we want to do with these people? How can we make it stickier so we got them where we want them, right? They've come to us. We have, they've, they've actually gone through some process to get to us. And now what? That's the question of today, right? That all of the goals of this is to get people back to your website. And we have all hopefully um, woken up to say that while we used to believe or wanted to believe, our executive director wanted to believe that that our association was the top of mind and the first thing that every member wakes up in the, in, you know, in the morning and goes to see, that we've come to the conclusion that most humans are super busy and they have a lot to do. And typically going to the association website is not the priority, right? So getting them to your site is a very big deal. And usually they're only coming to your business. A lot of times they're just coming to your site when they've been prompted and when they've been prompted is something that's really truly they have a need, right? So the whole question there is do we understand the buyer's journey? Because again, the probability is that most of your users in your association, whether prospective customers, customers, registrants, members, donors, however you want to phrase those users, 
the premise is that they're probably not coming onto your website by happenstance. So one thing that's really nice about associations and nonprofits, it's super targeted. Because once you get them to your website, they've got a need. The probability is they have a need. What I mean by that is most association websites aren't that type of website that you're like, you know what, um, I've got 10 extra minutes. Like I wonder, let me just browse and see what's up within you know, this partic my particular society. It's not kind of one of those CNN, ESPN, you know, Yahoo, Bing type, you know, overall kind of you know, wondering what, you know, I've got some time to kill and, and going to check in. Your website, unfortunately, is usually not top of mind. It doesn't fit into that entertainment extra time bracket. So therefore, what, but the good news about that is that it's a good qualifier. Because by the time they really get to your website, again, it's not happenstance. There's something there that they want. There, there's something there that they want or need. And our job now is to try to discern what that is and then make sure that we can um, be able to give them what they need while they're there. Right? That's the whole premise of today's kind of talk. So the website is key. I just wanted to set the stage for how they got there. All right, so let's go now to the basics. So the basics, again, just stepping back and recapping. What is the marketer's primary goal? Right? Is it logos? <laughs> I was with a client yesterday and they said, our, you know, the thought was our primary goal as a marketer was logos. Right? Is the primary goal to put out and make sure everybody's up to your visual identity standards? You know, is it to you know, make sure that you send out the latest print brochure? No. The primary goal of the marketer is to understand who you're targeting. Right? It's to understand your target. It's to understand who am I targeting and how I get them to the end goal and what's that path and how do I get there in the most frictionless, fastest, low cost way possible. That's what marketers are trying to do. Right? So therefore they're saying, I have to really know who I'm trying to target. I have to understand what appeals to them, what's going to be an incentive, what's going to make friction, what's going to make it frictionless, what are the consideration options that someone goes through to make this journey, and then how am I going to measure success? Right? That's the marketer's primary goal. So our goal is to be user experience um, designers. That's what we're trying to do. We're not, our goal is not to just get a number of people visiting our website. So having a number, you know, a total common stat is, is that people report is unique number of visitors on your website per month. Okay, well that's awesome, but it, the point is to not just get them there, but to get them to do something, right? So what we really care about is that conversion. Because it's great that they're coming, but what maybe then a more important number is how many of them just came and left. So really then the metric we probably want to look at is bounce rate. Because if you come in and you've got this big bounce rate, then you haven't, you've lost them. Right? We need to focus in on that. You might want to say, why don't we have that as a metric? Like we have visitors and we want to bounce rate. Because usually it's because you haven't planned out what you want them to do. Like you're so excited you got them there, but then you kind of abandoned ship with them. And in today's world, sitting in with the modern consumer, that, you know, we talk about that a lot, that's not the experience that people are expecting. Right? So we have to say, the, the modern marketer's primary goal is to know who we're targeting, have already pre-planned the journey we want them to take, and have dropped in all the different little breadcrumbs and incentives, et cetera, and have thought through what happens when they don't take the step we want, and then how do we reward them when they do take the step that we want. So what we, that means is we need to map this out so we have a really good understanding of what we want that ideal journey to be. Right? And that's kind of what is called making your website sticky. And I think that this is a more advanced version because this is a term that's been out there a long time, like make your website sticky with good content. That worked you know, several years ago, but it's not enough anymore. So we're going into the next level of evolution of let's say websites and digital communications of adding in, well, what does that exactly mean? Because the last time it was premised on, I just got them to the website and that was supposed to be good enough and I left, left them to explore. Now people are not in the exploration phase anymore. The modern user wants to be, um, wants to be led through and catered to along that process. Okay? So that's what we're going to explore today. So again, going back to just defining one more time on sticky content. So what we want to do 
is look at, again, moving from sticky as just being like, wow, I have a pretty website and it's responsive and I have content and I have a navigation uh, menu and I have um, an advanced search and a keyword search. That worked. Uh, that's been the standard for many years. But the new standard is really that sticky means that when I get them there, I have put in place purposeful things to hold their attention, right? To get them to spend longer time period, you know, longer slices of time on my site, if you will, to radically reduce down that bounce rate. That's really my goal is sticky content. So I've purposely designed content, and this is different than we're going into a new phase of kind of talking about content design in the association world. And if, don't feel bad because many of us don't have this content. We kind of have high-level content, right? We have kind of promotional content like, you know, why to be a member and here's the goals and mission and here's what we do and here's lots of articles and here's, you know, research and kind of our offerings and then our kind of promotional pieces about us. But we haven't, many of us have not really designed content that's been designed to be an interactive piece between the prospective buyer and the organizational entity. It's, it's for many of us wholly new, right? And in the terms of content funnel, it would be BOFU, bottom of the funnel, okay? So that people are using that bottom of the funnel content that we have put and prepared for them, it's also telling us this is probably a highly qualified prospect who really is showing us buying signals and ready to buy, or something that we can now, we, they're showing to us that they really want to spend time with us. And so it's sticky by design. So one of the things we want to go back as we talk through this today is to kind of do an assessment to say, do we have any of this content? What could we use? What could we design to make it sticky? And how do we put that together? And for again, most organizations, we have a lot of social channels, we have our website, we might have other kind of microsites. We have our e-commerce platform. Um, we have a lot of different other kinds of uh, pieces of technology. And we've got to that point. We've got all the elements for the recipe. But what we haven't done is do the digital transformation kind of digital ecosystem map and how that works with actually making money. And that's this next kind of optimization kind of era, if you will, that we're in. Okay, so talking further about the stickiness. So that means to us, to say do we have sticky content, is are we levering technology to keep visitors engaged? And probably more importantly, are we measuring it at each piece? Because right now, now we're, now we're focused in on creating kind of a laboratory experiment, which is our website, where we have purposely designed pieces in to see if this human interacts with them, right? And then we're going to make assessments. If they did interact, what does that mean? If they didn't interact, what does that mean? Right? And we're always using that scientific method of kind of test, tweak, and measure. So um, the piece that we really want to bring out here is that the era that we're moving away from is kind of this self-driven, do-it-yourself um, website design process, which is the assumption is kind of like I got an email, I clicked on a link, or I somehow got to your website, maybe just through Google search, and that then I've left the user to rely on site navigation, and my keyword search to find their content. Okay? That's what's considered old school. Like no one wants to do that anymore because none of us have the patience to do it and it's frustrating, right? So that idea that we have to kind of adopt this premise has changed. The user's premise has changed, right? That if they're engaged enough, they will then follow these behaviors, but that we have to kind of adopt that site navigation and um, and keyword search is not going to cut it anymore. We've got to do more, all right? And a lot of that is because, if you remember, we talk about this a lot, you have to remember the goldfish rule that the typical user now has less than two-second attention span. So, but, I mean, that's it, right? So you, everything is now about catering to them and making it interactive because if it's interactive and they're required to do something to get something of value, now you have better engagement. Right? And so that sticky content is really premised on this piece of it. So even right then, you can say, think about all your communications and people coming back to the website. Even if you bring them back to a specific page, are you then just kind of leading them to make their own conclusions? And as we now know, 70% of buying decisions happen without you involved. <laughs> so, the, so it's solely based on what's on your website, what they can find out about you. And so you need enough things where they can come in and have kind of interactive playtime with you where they're developing 
their own, um, you know, thoughts and premises, you know, perceptions of it. And what they're doing is they're looking for reasons for why either you do or don't fit into something that's of value to them. So they're making all these value assessments without you, right? Which scare and terrifies many a marketer. But it's less terrifying if you understand that you have a better shot at, at increasing your probability they'll buy if you've designed in these interactive pieces and you're providing them sticky content to help them come to you, right? Many of the times, by the time they're at their site, they're already predispositioned to go with you. They're looking for reasons why they shouldn't go with you. That's kind of a key thing as well, right? They're looking for reasons like, oh, what's with your e-commerce card? Like they're looking for reasons to abandon ship. You want to give them no reason ever to abandon ship. And in fact, you want to give them additional content that they didn't expect to say, oh, well, that's helpful. Like that's really helpful. And so we're going to talk about some of those um, uh, ideas as well. So this then puts more onus on planning, right? So planning now is super back in style. I mean, we all say we want to do it. Oftentimes, though, unfortunately, planning gets kind of put on the, um, the, uh, the bucket list or, you know, it's on the to-do list. I call it the, uh, the TDL. It's on the to-do list. So it's on the list. So we try to get it there. But in fact, today we have to do it because we have to map these experiences out and then, again, be able to identify who's the persona, what's their buyer's journey, do we have the content, do we have these kinds of um, interactive features and how we're going to measure it. So today, the, again, the, the key is that it's got to get personal, right? And I feel like this year, if all years, I have heard this term every time I'm talking to somebody, I'm hearing from organizations that they're under the gun to provide personalization. Personalization is like, you know, it used to be engagement. Personalization, I think, is like the 2016 buzzword of the year in the association marketing kind of world. So we all have to get personal. And the expectation, of course, of the user is that there is no reason at all, no excuse, why you don't provide them with a personalized experience. Because they're a member, you know, likely to you after all, and you've collected all this information. And then, unfortunately, we still play in the world of all the other brands who've gotten this down to a science. So those tertiary competitors, all those brands out there that set the standards for what it is to have an online experience, this interactive, fun, experiential, you know, somewhat entertainment-oriented experience, those same users don't change their perceptions and expectations when they come to the association website, right? They're not like, oh, you know, that's okay. I mean, they're, they're coming thinking this is what they're predisposed to and they're used to. And so we have to say, are we fitting the bill with how – the, you know, the, the for-profits and the digital brands do it well. So the best way I can think about this, and again, it doesn't always, and I, have, I can hear everybody saying, well, yeah, but I don't have the same budget at Starbucks. And you're right, you don't have the same budget. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't do things purposely in a little slightly different way and still do this with, you know, not the budget at all, you know, like the sliver of the budget. A lot of it is just in the thoughtfulness. And I'm, I'm telling you that from experience. I've taken products to international markets, I swear, with duct tape and Gorilla Glue and good plan of action. And you can do a lot with just, you know, ingenuity and, and the uh, thought pattern. Thought pattern has to be like you're not going to outsmart us, right? Because you know these guys better than anybody else. Association nonprofits have much greater data, much better data than the for-profits do. So always remember that. You're really in a position of power in this world of personalization. So again, framing it up, the old school, this is how I like to think of it old school way of getting someone to your website, right, and leaving them there, it's like you walked into Walmart and somebody gave you an empty shopping cart and that's it. I mean, I shouldn't even say it, somebody. You went and got the shopping cart yourself and you started going throughout Walmart. Like not even a greeter. Like you didn't even have a guy that's a greeter. You just old school, you've got to, you're on your own, right? This is for you to figure out where do I find the nuts and bolts, where is the milk, what if I want to buy a fish? What if I need a new pair of jeans? You know, like you, you have to figure out the whole lay of the land of how Walmart decided to lay it out. And sure, you have aisles. And sure, you have signs, right? But at the end of the day, it's on you to figure out how to shop it and, and get through the store, right? The whole thing's on you. That's the old school way of designing websites and designing these online experiences, okay? The new school way is far more like Nordstrom, right, it's probably a good example. The new school way is like I have a personal shopper, right? I walk in, I get a personal shopper, I have a concierge level of treatment. They're not giving me any floss. They're not going to, they're right there with me like exactly what do you need, 
You don't care that we have you know, palm trees on sale and that it's time for spring bulb planting. None of that. I came for this specific thing and they're going to walk me not only to where the location is, but while I'm there, they're giving me helpful information about it, right? How I can be a better person, how I can be a better, you know, me, right? That's the whole new school idea that they're there to have my back to provide me with these awesome, amazing ways that I can be the best me I can be, right? And that's super applicable in the association nonprofit world because especially in the association world, especially for professional level associations or professional level you know, memberships or trade organizations, look, these member companies are a company, they're a member to you or the individuals of a member to you because they care about being successful, right? So your, your value to them is that you have information or tools or techniques or education, something to make them even better. That's the value exchange that you have. Right? So it's different nowadays than it used to be. It's not necessarily that I want to be part of just this collective whole and be this community. A lot of times nowadays it's more like I want the association to help me advance individually. Right? So I need to know the, the association's got my back, which is why you see those differences now. You know, people aren't as interested in coming to a four-day conference with all 3,000 other people because they're not so focused in on that piece. They're focused in on the I want to see for my dollar that I spend how you're going to make me a better CPA, dentist, you know, doctor, whatever that case may be, or how my company is going to benefit and how my membership to you is going to make me more money or avert risk or things like that. It's a very one-to-one -one type of a relationship. And somehow some of that community, you know, goodness of like, you know, we just want to be part of the industry. Some of that has kind of fallen away in today's kind of modern consumer uh, viewpoint. So bottom line here, if that's the premise, if the person who's coming to your site wants to understand how you're going to make me a better me in the new school way, it's this concierge level approach, well then I need to make sure that my digital content on my website and we have these, you know, we have uh, the sticky content we're talking about has been designed in such a way to make me better every step of the way. And what do I mean by better? Probably smarter, probably more informed, probably um, helping me to make a buying decision that is better informed and a better choice, right? So it's being very transparent and understanding that your job as the association is to provide information, provide as much as you can, not tell them what to do, but provide the information so that they can make an adult decision based on data, right? That's kind of the new kind of way that we're thinking about that. And certainly the content you want to put out there is obviously, you know, going, probably going to be in your favor, but it's really understanding that the entire buyer experience over digital has changed. And I'm not going to get hung up on volume of people and numbers and, and that. I'm going to get hung up on if I had an individual looking like they were going to buy or investigating or looking like they're searching or shopping and I didn't get the right information to them, that's on me, the association. That's on me, right? That the buyer is going to do what the buyer is going to do. And we talked about in previous sessions how buyers are like cats. They're not like dogs anymore. I can't tell them what to do. Just because I gave them an early bird discount doesn't mean it's going to happen anymore, right? They're going to decide to do what they want to do. All we can do as the association is give them the materials and give them the information they need to make a decision that's going to fit them, okay? And it's about goodness to fit now in that value exchange. So the planning and the premise is really important so we spend some more time on that to really kind of hammer that one home because that's a big shift for many an organization and it's one of those critical kind of change management milestones that you undertake when you kind of go through this digital transformation process. So back on your members, again, with the expectation being that as the association nonprofit, you are in higher ed if you're on here as well. I know we have some of you guys out there. Hi, higher ed. Um, that your members out there is that you, you've collected this data about them for years. And so therefore, you should have a good sense of their needs and preferences and what they've purchased before and maybe what some of their predilections. And that if you don't know these things, you can continue to put in digital tools now to help you to ascertain that information and aggregate it so you can do more research on it, right? But that these things are not like unknowns anymore. You can put in a tool that will, you know, scrape all your content and serve up uh, intelligent content wizards and then see how they interact with people. It's not like these things don't exist. So it's about putting them in place to understanding them 
And now again, the fundamentals are in place is about now executing in this personalized environment. But again, your members expect this because the expectation is, especially if you're a member, like you should know me. It's like a patient coming into a doctor and it's not your first visit. You should have your chart on file. You should know my history, right? We should be past the, you know, have you ever had pneumonia? We should be past that, that phase. We should be into having, you know, developing a, an online relationship. So a couple of tips then as we move into it to think through on things like emails, this is kind of where we have some starts of some breakdowns. For most of us, the premise has been that the whole idea of email is to give a teaser copy, put in read more, and bring them back to a, land, to a, to a web page, rather, bring them back to the website. And so again, just to reiterate, how many of you when you're sending out your, this is just a take-home thought, how many of you are when you're creating your emails, and sometimes again, email people can be different than the web people, which is also a problem, who are different than social people, which is also a problem. But have we thought through, I clicked on the email, okay, my gosh, I got one, I got a click through, yay. All right, and I came back to the website, and maybe I know that conversion process, maybe I don't, um, but I got there, and then why? Right, so how many of us have outlined, when we're sending an email, are we thinking through, Okay, so they got, we, we're certainly thinking through, we want them to come to some particular website, but have we thought through, now what? Like when they got to the page, now what are they supposed to do? And for most of us, of course, we're so bogged down with just getting out the email, it's on the to-do list. We'd like to think through that. We have every intention. That would be great. We want to know conversions. We just haven't gotten there yet. So, but we've got to get there now because this is what the tertiary, you know, this is the landscape in which we now have to compete. So let's talk about then some evaluation techniques, right? So we've set everything up, we understand what we're trying to do. Let's talk about getting into some examples and evaluating how we're doing now. All right. So a couple of things, and this is now just getting into the idea phase. A couple of things that we think are disruptive ideas that have huge impact. This is, we didn't come up with this our own. This is just observational and from research about what works in the uh, greater digital market. Um, is that you might want to consider things like this. So I got to the website, but maybe, again, let's take the common premise of, in my email. That I'm not just clicking on an uh, article to read more about the article. I'm trying to get them to buy, right? We have to, like, let's agree on that. We're trying to get people to spend some money with us. Okay? So we're trying to get people to shop. So if in my email I'm trying to give them a link to register or buy a product or attend a webinar, anything that's a, a purchase-based behavior, we might want to consider why we not spend more time on developing the landing spot where they come, right? So one of the ways that for-profits do this really well is they might set up microsites or landing pages, but sometimes a little bit more than just one page to, per product. So if it's that specific for you, you know, and it's that important and you really have revenue you can drive from it, instead of just spending all of your time bombarding people with email to take you back to a page that doesn't get you much, Maybe we should spend more time on developing out that page when I do get there, right? Because that, that's a really a big piece because that's an abandonment point. That could be my bounce rate issue. But I haven't really thought through the experience when they go to look and to research my product, right? So microsites or kind of landing pages per product is something that is very popular in the rest of the world to be able to do digitally because it, gives, it affords us an opportunity to create a better experience, right, that once I've gotten that person there, I can help them do a better job shopping. This is my total Nordstrom concierge type of um, experience. So again, it's different than like dropping them onto the shopping cart or dropping them just onto a description page where all the other webinars are, are done. This is really building it out further. And what's interesting is most of us do this already and it's called the annual conference, right? So you don't just have annual conference is not a line item in your shopping cart for most of us, but for many of us, all those seminars and, you know, or webinars are. So we might have to say, do we do a good service, you know, do we do a disservice to some of our products that really we know are certainly popular? Now, I'm not sure I would say this is true for all products, but the ones you're really trying to roll out or that are featured or that's something specific or you have a campaign around, it probably warrants having a little bit more um, love for these types of pieces. So when we build those out, we have to ask ourselves these questions. These are really some of your, your take-home questions here. Is that are you giving the right information? Are you creating the right environment for that person to say, oh my gosh, yes, you, I want you, right? Again, they're looking for opportunities to click away. You need to present them for opportunities to stay, okay? And so let's look at some examples for how 
um, some of the, you know, obviously, the masters are doing that, right? Let's learn from the masters. So let's look at Apple. So here's our iPhone 6S product kind of microsite, right? And I say it's a microsite because there's multiple pages within this. It's really by a series of landing pages that are connected together. But look at how they've done this, and let's, let's kind of uh, take some big takeaways. One, they've got the BSI, big, sexy images. We talk about that all the time. Big. They've got good typography. They've got good font, right? Typography is really critical. If you do it well, your competitors will copy you. We see it all the time in High Road. All of our competitors copy the things that we do. So big, sexy imagery. You've got good fonts, right? And look, they've made it interactive right off the bat. I have watched the film, watched the keynote, watched the TV ads. Probably particularly important given who maybe their target market is, that we have video kinds of content. But we have to say that maybe that's something that would help support us in, let's say, marketing a certification class or something like that. Right? But just the way they situa situated it, and so much today in this world is about packaging. Right? Like you probably have the fundamentals and the functional content, but if the packaging isn't right, we're going to click away. It's giving me a reason like, you know, I don't know, do I have a beautifully designed bottle of perfume or like the bottle of perfume that says perfume? You know, and the one that just says perfume, a little skeezy, gives me like the creeps, I don't know, I'm going to go for the prettier one. Right? And that aesthetic is rampant throughout the digital world because digital now is so beautiful and you can do so much with it and it's so mobile friendly and it's a very intimate connection that we have. You know, because so much of us come through mobile, that's a more intimate even more so than using our you know, laptop, etc. So we can't, we can't take those things off the table. They're very critical in today's digital world. Right? So the other thing that this does very well is it really uh, breaks down. If you notice like the top little navigation here, we have 3D touch and design and cameras and technology, iOS tech specs and buy. Buy obviously in blue because if I just know that I want it, I can jump right there. So they, they've understood where I might be. But if I want to go ahead and start browsing, they've given me the types of materials that I need in order to um, make good buying decisions. So here's kind of one of our first examples of sticky content. Okay? So it's giving me, right off the bat, being very transparent. They're not trying to hide anything from me. Here's all of the comparison of the different models we have. right? And again, it's saying, we're transparent. You're a smart user. Here's what we've got. You match up to you, and you make your own decision. It's very respectful. Okay? So imagine to say, if I'm coming to my annual conference page and I'm trying to understand, do I have this laid out where I can see the comparison? And maybe I have a comparison between webinar, seminar, annual conference, and I see what are the things I can get versus each one of them. Right? I should measure them against each other. Maybe I want to say my different membership packages. Many of us have that. But do we have it like in a package benefits chart with like checks and, and whatnot or like super easy so I can very much understand, oh, I want the better one because that's going to be better for me. Or the classic marketing example, the one that you really want them to take, you put right in the middle. Right? If you notice here, iPhone 6 Plus, where is it? Right in the middle. So they're going to situate in such a way that you go, that's the one I want, and it's the one in the middle. Because the things in the extremes people tend to throw out, they go for the middle. Right? So a little technique there. But have you thought about packaging up these pieces, like maybe different research products that you have? How do they compare? But that comparison chart idea is just a very common sticky content type of piece that you can bring up. But again, a lot of it's on the aesthetics and the packaging. A lot of people say, I know Suzanne, but I have it all written out. Okay, what do we say about people writing out on the web, on email? Not so much. People are you know, they're, they're going to read it if they're really uh, interested in it, and they, you know, hopefully we have data to show it, the metrics to show us that. But if we can do it in a very visually appealing way, and I can instantly be able to understand it by just you know, looking up, then that's probably more so where we want to head. All right. We also want to play with things like cross promotional efforts, right? Do we have the additional things would help to um, either um, get the user to say, "Yeah, I'm making the right decision," right, or to allow them to, again transparency so that they can feel like they're making a solid decision. No one wants to feel like they're hoodwinked. They don't want to feel like they're trapped in a the corner. They, you know, we have to remember the user is the empowered one now. We can't. They're not dogs. We can't tell them what to do, and they're not going to obey. Right? So you have to set it up, give them the examples, give them information, and treat them like a cat. When they decide to come to you, right, you're going to have to be like really, really excited to see them and reward them and say nothing about the time that they're, you know, are not interested in you. That's irrelevant. It's only when they're interested in you. 
the user has all the power. So in order to do that, things we can do to help the user to come to side more with you know, to be more persuasive towards us is to offer these types of things that we know align with how buyers today shop or how they make buying decisions. Things like, you know, just because I, the brand, said we're the best association since, you know, the dawn of time and we have the best content, that's not nearly as powerful as if a key figure in my industry says, I get my content from the association of X, Y, and Z as well, right? Having product reviews that are both good and bad, very important to helping people make the right decision. Okay? That also strikes a fear in many an association marketer because it's that same fear of like we had about social media, about what if they talk back, what if they say something bad. But again, we're in that world today. If you don't have any haters, everybody thinks you're nice and lovely, that's very flat. Okay? It's actually not a, it's not a good thing. It's a, you're very vanilla and you're not important. That's kind of the key. If you have, you know, that's what the celebrities would say, bad buzz, good buzz, still buzz. So, you know, obviously we don't want a lot of bad buzz in association, but if everything is too seen as too pristine and too, you know, perfect, people don't, they don't believe it anymore, right? We have a very skeptical, powerful, empowered, sophisticated buyer, right? We're all skeptics. We're like, hmm, nobody's that happy with all their products, right? Nobody ever, so we need to remember that. That authenticity factor is a very key now for a, a buyer being able to understand, is this something that is, really for me, or like, you know, what's the deal with this association, right? Especially as you go down in generations. That's really important. The younger your, your buyer gets, the more they're looking for authenticity, and they get the reality that, you know, it's not all things to all people. They're trying to understand, you got something for me, and are you real? And that's a, a good piece of that. Obviously, putting in recommended products, other products, so here's what other people have bought, all of that kind of Amazon-y technique. Clearly, we can follow the master of Amazon of e-commerce and, and be able to look at that and know that works. And then I think the other thing is we have to say, do we have kind of a plan on the cross-promotional way to how do we pull content or push it once they've actually decided not to buy or they've left the site and they've left us? Do we have a plan for that, right? And that's where, again, like transactional email can really come in handy, right? So we're starting, I mean, we at Hyra starting to do a lot more work in the e-commerce space about being able to think through those purposeful design experiences that are all hyper-personalized based on my shopping experiences and things like that. That makes sense, right? I spent three minutes on my annual conference website and on these particular pages on the agenda and keynote, but I didn't actually decide to buy. Maybe that's a good trigger to send an email talking about the content, et cetera, and saying, hey, do you want to get on the list for our blog about the annual conference? you know, to keep them engaged, right? There's all those types of things we can now do. All right, here's some other ideas for how to make things interactive. So Journal of Neuroscience is a society for neuroscience. Love them, talk about them all the time. Uh, obviously, very smart people. <laughs> they're very smart. They have smart members, and they, therefore they do digital smart. So in, in their journal, you can see already that they've, um, look at the uh, outline box. If you're just listening, look up for a second on the screen. You can see the outline red box. They're already helping the user because they're looking at this abstract. So if I'm taking the time to go to the journal site to look at an abstract, right, I'm in some sort of research understanding mode of like asking, well, who's done work on this? That's, my, that's what the buyer's thinking. And so they've already helped me out by saying, hey, here's similar articles in this journal. Well, that's helpful because, see, they've already kind of pre-tagged it for me and pre-associated it. That's a helpful concierge level experience, right? Because they're saying to me, here's the other things we got. You didn't make any work for me. I didn't have to figure that out. The other couple things I want to point out that are like, you know, again, this is not something that it just takes a little time and maybe elbow grease to do, but it aligns with the way the modern shopper is, which is in their Journal of Neuroscience, they've taken the time to create an archive of just the cover images, which seemingly simple, but since we're visual shoppers many a time or visual identifiers, being able to have that at the ready makes it interactive. Because now I can look and say, oh, look, here's all my cover images, right? And I can just flip through. But now I, the, the, um, the shopper, if you will, I'm shopping through content in this case, I'm actually able to now interact with the site and be able to click through. And I'm looking for the, when I get the match between the cover and what I'm looking for, right? I'm like, oh, I remember it has something in there about, and maybe it's like a DNA strand. Click, click, click. That's the one, okay? Thank you, Journal of Neuroscience. That was very helpful. And they haven't been frustrated, and the user hasn't abandoned ship. Similarly, love this, 
Not only do they do it for kind of the hardcover, but they do it kind of for the video archives as well, right? Very modern approach because now I've gotten the choice of what kind of content. Do I want to get it and have to read it, or do I want to have it from a video perspective? Thank you, Journal of Neuroscience. That's also further interactive, helping me to either say, I should be part of this journal and subscribe, or like, man, I've got like the best journal subscription provider ever, and like, again, creating need in me that I want to both read it and or let's say publish in it, right? I need to be there. So they're doing a great job with that of making it interactive. A couple other techniques that um, Society for Neuroscience does to help, again, increase the stickiness, and we talked, we talked about this one before, is they use what are called intelligent content widgets, right? This is by a company called Bright Info that snaps into uh, your website and can do all the, a bunch of all, all other things like other digital advertising campaigns and things like that. But the bottom line is what it does is as I'm exploring, right, and I'm clicking on things, the algorithm behind here is understanding my patterns based on a whole, you know, tags and also um, contextual references and things like that, and serving up content that fits that algorithm that's similar to the content that I'm currently looking at or have looked at. Okay? Now that's helpful because that's a whole other way that I have not I've given another a third dimension for how a user can stay sticky with my site without relying on them doing the work to keyword search or to navigation search that way. And I've kept it in the realm of what they're looking for. And that's nice because now it doesn't matter where I physically have stored the content, under which navigation item. It doesn't matter where I physically put it into tagging. The user doesn't have to guess that. This is now the site working for the user and giving me the Nordstrom concierge level kind of content experience, right? So I love this tool. We use it. Ours is obnoxious because we're using it for examples. It's all over our site, so don't be like, wow, well, but there's for a purpose. And the, um, and the purpose there, again, is to be able to understand and get those insights. And when you know it, as those things come up, if I click on it, don't I get all of that type of metrics behind it so that I can ascertain what are the hot topics, et cetera? Well, of course I do, right? Why would I put it in there if I can't measure it? So it's helping, again, to build the profile, understand the lead scoring, understand the persona that we talked about. Here's another example of that. You can place these content widgets wherever you want within the site. This one, again, is popping up at the bottom. It's helping you to get, you know, 2015 to review top 10 articles, giving you the visual, but it's interactive, it's moving, so my eye, my goldfish, attention, you know, what's that? So before I'm scrolling down, I'm, that's coming out for me, and it's, it's going to work, right? So that's super helpful. Last couple things on that, <laughs> you can also use these types of, um, um, you know, what are often called modals to pop up to, again, get people before they leave or while they're shopping, et cetera. You see this all the time in the for-profit world that you can get them to interact right then and there. Like, like this content, see that you're not signed up to our blog, right? A very low entry point to get people into your content world or blog, right? Plus, they're super search engine friendly, so that's, but people are kind of revamping how they do them now because of this reason, right? So it could be the same thing. Don't see you're on our non-member newsletter, right? All these kinds of pieces that I can now put these interactive pieces to help people stay with me, and also if they decide you know, no way I want to sign up for your blog, sign up. That tells me something which is information I can use. If they do do it, that's also good information for me to use, right? So in, in the digital world, the response, the desired response is not always met, but by them not taking the desired response, that's equally insightful, right? And I think we always focus in on showing like there's a pre-push to only show like what's glossy and sunny and shiny and that we did right, but seeing what's not working is just as important, sometimes if not more so, to be able to guide us to what we need to do next. It's kind of like in sports. Winning doesn't teach you that much. Losing teaches you a whole lot more about what to do next time. Okay? And so we want to think about our digital metrics too. So a lot of times when I come and I look at, you know, we're working with um, organizations and we're doing kind of digital transformation audits and things like that, and I'm looking and if you only show me metrics that are all positive and shiny, I, you know, I go, you know what, there's another half of this that we're missing, right? Because the other ones are more telling about who didn't do it. It's just something to keep in mind. Balanced approach, just data, just trying to point us in the right direction. So another kind of example of an uh, interactive tool is um, one that, um, uh, that I love. Everybody loves this one because, you know, you get to, it's kind of like a self-assessment. So any type of self-assessment tools, like how are you doing as a CPA in your career? How would you rate yourself? 
like those types of self-assessment tools are always popular, always popular. So allowing the, the individual again to interact with your website to get information that again is what? Back to what's in it for me, right? So that's how I was telling them. So this happens to be HubSpot's uh, website grader. You go out there and you type in your website, and you guys can do it today. You type in your website, you hit go, and it tells you how you stack up across all of these kind of digital channels, right? And so that's giving you feedback instantly. So you could, that's a great way, especially from like a do I want to be a member kind of thing, or I'm, I'm possibly thinking about um, how do I compare um, about like, you know, I'm a potential CPA candidate, you know, things like that. How do I rate? How do I stack up? Any of those types of tools you could put in from like a membership perspective or am I ready to go to the next level of membership or, you know, student to member, is this right for me? Any of those self-assessment tools are, are always um, highly popular along with like calculators and things like that. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is that in today's world, you know, we're past the um, having to, the way that it's done, let me put it that way, is that it's all based on me being able to know that user and, and predict what they're going to want or, or understand them and serve up the content that they want to be able to see. And that idea is pervasive across email and landing pages and websites and whatnot. Images. So the images I'm seeing, all of these things should be based on what's called smart or dynamic. But that idea that it's that it's individual for me, based on me, right? So you've either you as the organization have either seen my choices or I have told you enough that you're going to be able to serve up that content. And here's an example. This is HubSpot. This is one of one of the ways they do it within their landing pages. So basically, the content that I'm creating, I can switch it out automatically by knowing where that user is coming from, from the purpose of, let's say, from a perspective of what country they're coming from. How could I know that? I know the IP address. It's coming in through the website. So if I see that IP address mapped back to somebody in Spain, I can serve up Spanish content. Or it's mapping back to somebody in Canada, I can automatically serve up dual language uh, uh, content or whatnot. Or let's say a specific offer. Or let's say I know I'm coming in from the Philippines and we're about to have a conference there, well that might be the time when I say, hey, don't forget, you know, in six months we have our, you know, our regional APAC meeting there, whatnot. It can also serve up by device type. So I can serve up different content if I know I have a mobile user, let's say versus desktop, right? We talked to a language, what about referral source? So if I bought an ad onto one of my sister organization sites and I know it's coming from them, this person has clicked on that ad and they're coming to me, I know the referral source because I've given them what? A trackable URL to do that. And that referral source, now I can provide that type of content. Referral sources might be all other things. I know they're coming from Google. I know they're coming from whatnot. But the point is I can get in front of the user in today's world by using readily available tools, right? So I can do that. I can also say like a contact list or life cycle stage. If I know that let's say they're a board member or they're a committee member or they've already registered for the conference, I can serve up content that's appropriate by understanding what kind of list criteria they fit on. If I know that they're a prospect versus they're already a member, serve up content like that. Doesn't that make sense? Of course it does. I can be able to do that in a way that's going to help lead people down that buyer's journey that I'm looking for them to do. All right? So that's kind of smart content, kind of, and that's how I should use it. I should be deploying it in a way that I know who they are, so basically, if I don't know who you are and I have anonymous content, I have some default settings. But the likelihood, especially on an association site, is I probably do know who they are. Again, because people don't really happen to dance across your site every day. The likelihood is that, that you do know who they are. And so the next step is have you design that experience to help move them down the path that you want, right? Ultimately, we're trying to get them to go to the cart. So, some of the extra rules there, this is kind of how you do it. You know, basically you can say, if I'm going to have it on mobile, here's what I'm going to see, if not, et cetera. And so all these types of things are commonly available in enterprise marketing automation software. That's like a, yeah, it's just a standard. Any, any of those, um, like any of the Marketos or HubSpots, you're going to have those um, opportunities to have that. And of course, again, just noting here, you get the data. So isn't that helpful? So I'm going to be able to see how that works, and I can make it smart, and I can be able to then test and further target. So kind of just summing up on other interactive content tools and ideas, these calculators, the video, interactive media, quizzes, games, product reviews, deep dives, especially I think in the association world, especially when you're talking about membership or especially when you're talking about the power of why hold the certification, why renew it, um, why to come to the annual meeting, why to become a speaker, 
you know, why to be involved in your online community, why it's important, really doing more on the deep dive part so that you can get in the, um, the testimonial factor, right, the review factor. And then again, whoever is giving you the testimonials to give it straight, right, to give it straight to you to say like, you know, I also was thinking that I wasn't really sure that I wanted to become, you know, undergo this uh, rigorous CPA process because I think basically, frankly, skip it and go get a job somewhere else. But here's why I decided to do it, right? And here's the things that I went, really went through to make that decision. <clears throat> if you could get that type <clears throat> excuse me, of testimonial on video, <clears throat> and then ultimately, right, you're showing, you're showing your authenticity, but you're giving them the ability for them to interact and to be able to make a decision for themselves. Again, a respectful, cat-driven type of understanding. And then maybe you follow that with like, here, here's a comparison interactive little calculator to find out is it right for you. And you score yourself, right? And it's over a seven, it's like, you sound like a good candidate. Let's take the next step. That type of idea is what we spent the whole last hour talking about in sticky content, right? So at the end of the day, what we want to, um, you know, our key takeaways is that we want to make sure that we're, number one, we can't serve everybody. You know, there's some default level of our, People come to our site and they use our content and that's fine, et cetera. We probably in today's world call them kind of the checkbook members, like keep on signing checks and that's great. Probably what we want to do is focus in on who we want to really drive business from. So either top line growth or continued growth. Let's laser focus into that persona, right? Under or at least laser focus into that group of people. Identify the common characteristics, create the persona. Right? And then we need to take that next step of doing the content mapping to go with the buyer's journey process and asking ourselves at every step along the way, have we given them the right content to help them make an informed decision, to help make them, you know, and help them do, go through the consideration process. Right? So they, we're very transparent in understanding. Here's, and we know you have a lot of different choices. We know you can spend your money elsewhere. Here's why, you know, here's why other people have chosen us. But ultimately, we show the respect to the end user to say that you're going to vote with your feet and what you decide to do is, is how you decide to do it, right? And we're in a world now of, of creating value, this value has changed, and making sure that it's based on trust, right? And so I guess with that, I mean, you know, look at it together, that's really the high road way to do. That's the high road way to do business, right? And it's very different than well, how we are coming out of like a volume play. Like if you hear like, you know, we have... You know, it's not pushing the numbers anymore. It's not saying we've got 10,000 members. You know, it's not pushing the volume. It's pushing the idea that you're important to us as an individual. That's a big kind of, again, piece of what's happened with inbound marketing. So just wrapping up today, so we talked about um, some great interactive ways that I can, uh, hopefully good ideas for you. All of these things are readily available. People are putting them into place now, just showing, you know, um, showing you some ideas for it. Even like the Apple example, you could you could copy that today. You could rip off and duplicate. You could you know you can R and D that one. Um, you can look at that and say, wow, do we have uh, big images? Do we have a couple of pages we can put together? Yes, everybody has that capability. It, remember, a lot of it now is just taking the time to map it out and to map out purposely how we're going to make that content sticky and then give those pieces of content to help people make informed decisions. That's kind of the, uh, everything we wanted to get through for today's Inbound Lunch Bunch. And next time we will see you in March. Again, as always, do good work. Looking forward to having feedback. All of the uh, resources and materials will come out after this. And with that, everybody have a great day. Again, uh, thank you for joining us.